obviously so many people um, because when you're young you're so influenceable you know yeah. and yeah. Uh, a lot of people really turned my head I, I remember the very moment that I fell in love with the theater and that was uh, with a guy named Knox Fowler I was in high school I had been in a couple of plays um, I, I thought I was going to be a writer so I took all the courses that helped me push me in that direction so yeah. I was in a couple of plays but I was basically just showing off my junior year all of the seniors went to this local college. This is in Rockford, Illinois. And uh, they went, they had two days at this, uh, at the local college there. And they took all the seniors in the, in the journalism class and six juniors. And those names were pulled out of a hat and mine was one of them. Wow. <laughs> I wouldn't have been chosen to go, but I was uh, uh, lucky enough to go. And I went to an English class and... Uh, we, they were studying the, A Perfect Day for Banana Fish, which was my first J.D. Salinger exposure. And then there was a class called The Theater of the Absurd. And it was taught by a man named Knox Fowler, who was very, um, just bigger than life. He read from all the things that got me interested in the theater. Um, the leader, Ionesco, uh, he read the, the did the the story of Jerry and the dog from the zoo story. Right. Talked about Beckett. He had played um, Lucky in one of the first productions of Godot in this country, wow. um, and uh, he was just um, amazingly talented. It just blew my mind, and I left. That was like a ninety minute class, and I left that ninety minutes going, I have to be part of this world. Oh, <laughs> uh, so, so uh, but he was. For someone I didn't know, he changed my life. Wow. And um, after that, I went to Illinois State and had great faculty there and lots of great teachers and I think uh, great fellow classmates. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, you learn so much from the people you're struggling with. And then I graduated and um, I, I moved to Boston shortly after that. Uh, I attended community college for one year and a fellow had moved up there to start a, a, the Boston Public Theater, outdoor theater on the Charles River, and we did some stuff up there. And I was in the Richard III with the Theater Company of Boston. I had just seen them the day I arrived. I got there on closing night just in time to see their production of The Basic Training of Pablo Hummel uh, with Pacino and all those guys. And it was, to this day, one of the most amazing theatrical events in my experience. And about six months later, I'm in Richard III with all those same guys. Wow. Wasn't as good a production, <laughs> but it was still, I was 20, it closed on my 24th birthday. And so my, my teachers had been sort of Strasbourg actor studio people, and all those guys were actor studio guys. Um, Norman Arnellis, uh, Lance Henriksen. And they were, it, it was, I mean, I had a tiny role in it, but, you know, I was just around them forever. And we rehearsed every day of the run, you know, it was that kind of a thing. So that was pretty important to me. Um, then I apprenticed at the Alley Theater, and that was, um, you know, got to rub elbows with Nina Vance. And you always know people who really knew her, because any, anybody who referred to her as anything other than Miss Vance didn't really know her very well. <laughs> And uh, um, then I did a summer at uh, ACT in San Francisco, and uh, that was pretty important. And I rubbed elbows with William Ball just briefly, uh, but he, I remember him talking to us, and he said, there's three things I want you to know. He said, first, give up the idea of suffering for your art. He said, trust me, I don't know you all, but you've all suffered enough to play King Lear. Insufficient suffering is not your problem. <laughs> Let that go and take joy in your work. He said, and the second thing, take the time to write down what you want out of life. He said, don't just think about it. He said, I believe that the actual process of writing it down manifests it into action. He said, but you better be careful what you ask for because it will come true in some form. 
So if so, be very careful. If you just say you want to be a star, at some level you'll become a star of sorts. But it might cost you every good relationship in your life. It might cost you happiness. It might cost you lots of things. So be very careful what you put on your list because it will come true. And he said, and the third thing is, in the theater we need a new word. He said, we all know what it means to belittle someone or belittle something. He said, but the theater is all about belarging. It's the verb to be large. You have to be large the play that you're working on. You have to be large your fellow actors, be better than they have a right to be. You have to be large the audience and the community you serve. And so that was uh, the sort of last inspirational thing that really set me on my path as a as a still young man of 25, I guess, at that point. I love that. That's great. Theater. Uh, I graduated high school in 1967 and went to Illinois State as an undergraduate. And back there, there every I couldn't have pointed to New York City, but there was still a theater section of the New York Times, and every Friday we get quizzed on the, the theater section of the New York Times. And... At even long before that, the theater was the, the great invalid that was dying, and uh, what we've seen is that that ain't happening. But it has changed. I would say the things that I don't like it about it are the, the things that have narrowed the, the scope of what success means, what Broadway is. There, there's very little... Um, non-musical theater on Broadway of substance anymore. Uh, it, and it used to be you could see a perfectly fine play that would have a legitimate run for six or seven months without any stars in it, and it would be a wonderful play, and that would be that. And that's almost all gone. Um, somebody has to be a star. It has to be the playwright, the, the, you know, the, the leading actor. There has to be something in there. And even then, it's, it, it's a small world. And then, I guess, the for lack of a better word, the Disneyfication of Broadway, the, the, the recycling of cartoons and things. And I'm glad that people are attending the theater. And, you know, through all my time at Penn State and Florida State before that, that's employed a whole lot of our students on Broadway. Mm -hmm. And we're happy about that. But it doesn't sing to me. No, I don't want to lump everything in together. Um, the Lion King is not one of those things I'm talking about. Uh, you, you know, there there are, um, and then there are the other things that are perhaps unfair because they're not things I'm just going to go see. Right. <laughs> um, so I'm speaking out of ignorance, perhaps, but I've seen enough of them to know. Yeah, that's probably not where I'm headed. Um, the great thing is the diversification of voices that you see in the American theater now. Um, it looks like, you know, I rode the subway this morning, and the stage kind of looks like the subway now, mm. and it certainly didn't when I started going. Yeah. There are still obviously lots of problems connected with that, uh, but, uh, but the diversification uh, of uh, who's writing plays, who's acting in plays, who's directing plays, that's, that's, that's been the great step forward in my lifetime probably. That's great. If you had like a piece of advice that you were given, the best piece of advice you were ever given, and then did you follow it or not? <laughs> mm -hmm. um, best piece of advice, I, I, I can, hmm. this, is a, this is a great piece of advice that I was given, and I follow it sometimes. Hmm. Um, I, as an actor, I was um, one of the plays. I was lucky. I was six foot two and masculine and not so handsome that I that that, you know, that I had to carry the play or anything. I was a, always a supporting actor, and and uh, so I didn't have those burdens. So anyway, one of the plays that I was in, I was in four different productions of. Uh, Mr. Robert, um, and and one, I, Josh Logan directed me in at once, and uh, 
I did it with Mark Sheen. I did it with other people. Anyway, the, I was I was asked to do it a fourth time, mm -hmm. and and it was with people that I didn't know. Earl Holland was going to play Mr. Roberts, and we had done a film together, and I knew him just slightly. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had talked to Burt Reynolds, who had produced a show that Josh Logan had directed. So I was recommended, and they wanted me. And I didn't know anybody else. And I was talking to Neil Kenyon, and I said, I'm a little nervous about doing this because I know this you know, I've done this play now, and I don't know any of these people, and I'm going off there, and I think I know some things about this play, and I don't know how welcoming they'll be. And he said, stop. He said, you think you know, or you know? And I said, uh, I know. And he said, absolutely, you know. And they hired you because you know, and don't pretend that you don't know. And I went, good advice, yeah. good advice. Now, I mean, the flip side of that is, I can be arrogant, I can be stubborn, <laughs> you know, I can be convinced I'm absolutely right that ab about, not so much about that, because I'm right about that, but, <laughs> but other things. I mean, Josh. <laughs> Thank you for spending a few minutes with us up here in the library. It's mm -hmm. great. Talk about inspiration. Yeah.